Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Scott Anton with Gideon Taylor, and I want to welcome you to our webinar this month, uh, Opening Pandora's Box, Strategies for Effectively Scoping Custom Electronic Forms Projects. Paul, I'm just going to do a quick volume check. Can you hear me okay? Paul, are you able to hear me? First, I have to find my unmute button. Yes, I can hear you just fine. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Thank you. If you want to go ahead and uh, flip to the next slide. Uh, let me first take care of a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this session, and we will be sending out a link to the recording following today's webinar, so you can go ahead and review it at your leisure. Um, as, a, as a point of introduction in terms of understanding Gideon Taylor, um, we have been working with PeopleSoft for many years. We actually started as a PeopleSoft consultancy back in 2001, and uh, over the last 19 years now, our focus has really grown to helping organizations drive more value out of their existing PeopleSoft systems. Uh, and we do that primarily through helping them revolutionize business processes, uh, optimizing and automating business processes that PeopleSoft doesn't typically do or doesn't do the way that you would want them to do. Um, so our mission is to help organizations revolutionize business processes through a variety of different strategies, tools, and techniques. And our vision is to help our clients work simply, effectively, efficiently, and flexibly. There are three logos on that slide that Paul just advanced beyond. So I just want to mention uh, we are a longtime <laughs> Oracle Gold partner and our tool, GTE Forums, which you'll see a little bit about this afternoon, uh, is uh, Oracle certified for PeopleSoft. Uh, as far as we know, it's the only forms tool and self-service application developer that is uh, certified and validated for PeopleSoft. Next slide. Uh, we have worked with a lot of organizations over the last 19 years. Uh, all of the ones represented on this slide, as well as dozens more, uh, we've worked with to help them, again, optimize and automate unique and custom business processes uh, throughout PeopleSoft, HCM, Campus Solutions, and Financials. Next slide. That includes a variety of both delivered tools within PeopleSoft as well as our own GTE forms for PeopleSoft. Uh, that includes activity guides, guided self-service, PeopleSoft forms and approval builder, and custom development with the, with the approval framework. Our approach is to really adopt a best of breed approach. So looking at each organization's unique requirements for whatever business process or business processes they're looking to automate, uh, and then selecting the right tool and the right approach to match that and achieve whatever their objectives might be. This is our, uh, our quick cheat sheet uh, in terms of takeaways on the GTE Forms tool. And Paul will be showing you a couple of quick examples as part of our discussion this afternoon of what GTE Forms can look like. I mentioned already that it is Oracle validated. Uh, it is 100% people tools based. So in terms of GTE Forms, there's nothing foreign within GTE Forms that doesn't already exist within your existing PeopleSoft environment. It is predominantly a configuration based tool for both form creation and form management so that as your self-service requirements change over time, the way that you want pages to display, the kind of business logic that's governing uh, form behavior or self-service behavior, as well as your approval framework, your approval routing requirements, all of those things, or I should say many of those things, are configurable uh, and can be managed and maintained by business analysts. You've got native real-time access to all of that PeopleSoft data, including employee data, student data, finance data. You're taking advantage of your existing PeopleSoft workflow, security, and infrastructure. You have unlimited flexibility in how these solutions look, how they behave, what they do, how they route, and then what happens to the data when they're done. Uh, and they are mobile. Uh, you have the option within the setup pages within GTE Forms to select whether or not you want your form to display as classic or as fluid. So one of the really powerful capabilities of GTE Forms is that it can automatically generate fluid self-service applications with zero fluid development. It is all configuration based. Next slide. We've got a couple of upcoming webinars, and we certainly invite you to join us for those. Uh, we host these on a monthly basis. Uh, upcoming in March, we have one focused on page and field configurator. Uh, April, we are focused on uh, enabling external participants to engage with PeopleSoft workflow. 
So if you've got people outside the organization that are not PeopleSoft users, vendors, uh, parents in terms of like financial aid forms for universities, uh, candidates, uh, other folks that might not be PeopleSoft users within your database, uh, we'll show you how you can enable that. And then finally, uh, in May, PeopleSoft Visualize, getting the big picture with Pivot Grids, Analytics, and Kibana, getting your arms around an enterprise-wide view of uh, forms, transactions, and other self-service transactions through Pivot Grids and a variety of other analytics tools delivered within PeopleSoft. Next slide. All right, Paul, I'm going to go ahead and head it over to you. That's my part of the show. Take it away. Very good. Thanks, Scott. So uh, we just did some welcome and some introductions. And uh, this is a, just a look ahead at the session. We're going to be uh, doing a little bit of strategy discussion. We'll be doing a lot of, uh, of looking at specific solutions. The overall question is that we're trying to answer is, well, how do you scope an automation an automation project in PeopleSoft. How do you figure out how much time, how, how many resources, how much cost is going to be to do electronic forms automation or really any uh, workflow-based automation project? So that's what we will be talking to and hopefully get through the, the many pieces of info that we've got lined up for you here. So uh, it should look a little bit like this. Um, how to actually, I don't know, we, we actually stole this, Scott stole this from a different, uh, a different PowerPoint deck. I don't know that we've got a ton of how to in there, probably a little bit less than that. But uh, if you replace how to with big picture, then that I think makes sense. Uh, shameless plugs we've already covered most of, gratuitous infographics, this is the only one. Uh, well, I, get, I don't know, maybe you can call Scott's animation here next slide, a gratuitous infographic. And uh, I don't know if it's actually, if you can hear the, uh, the sound that is uh, included, but I don't know if any of you have played Burger Time back in the 80s. There were some of us, uh, Gen Xers who were around for uh, for Burger Time, but uh, we're going to follow that model today to uh, to look at electronic forms automation as if we're building a hamburger, and uh, and kind of split up the uh, split up the possibilities into four different levels, and. Uh, and specifically, we're talking about electronic forms automation. Now, we're talking about electronic forms automation in terms of a, uh, a form that you put together inside of PeopleSoft that includes gathering information, routing to recipients, and, uh, and then possibly updating PeopleSoft on the back end. And then the question is, well, okay, how long is it going to take to build one? So the tool, this could be our tool, GTE Forms. This could be custom development. This could be uh, using other tools. Uh, I will say PeopleSoft Forms and Approval Builder probably can't go much past level one or two without some major customizations, but uh, but you have some, you have a, a few different tools that you could work with, including activity guides and the custom page development that goes along with that. Either way, the, uh, the comparative scoping is about the same as in level one, you know, what's, what percent of, uh, of the development time is level one compared to level four. GTE forms, we're very confident is the fastest way to build robust electronic forms applications inside of PeopleSoft. So we will be talking on that basis. I just want to mention up front that, it is, that these concepts are applicable to whatever tool you end up using. So to begin with, level one, we'll talk about, we're talking about a form that sticks fields on a page, doesn't have any grids, has simple valid value lists for the fields, and may have some simple conditional form behavior, uh, hide a field, unhide a field, 
simple approval routings with, uh, with not a whole lot of conditional routing or ad hoc routings, and no updates to PeopleSoft data. So I hope actually that all of you have some requirements in mind, that you might think about a form that you're thinking about automating and see what level it fits in. Are you, is this a level one, two, three, or four uh, uh, effort that's gonna be required to automate that? And hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end that you can ask some questions, including about any specific form processes you have. So this level one, uh, does your requirement fit into this? Well, here's an example of what we would consider a level one electronic form. This is a veteran status declaration form that we built uh, as, a, uh, as a demonstration of potential onboarding forms. So this is out of a list of potential onboarding forms. Here is a mobile version of it. We've got a bunch of text. We pre-populated the, uh, the, the user ID and the name of the participant. We've got some basic conditional logic. So uh, as we make different selections, different parts of the form open and change, valid value lists change. And so it, and this looks pretty robust, but it, it's pretty, it's simple in the sense that these are all, uh, at least inside of GTE forms, things that a business analyst can build. And one of our business analysts built it in about I can't remember if it was an hour and a half. Scott will chime in and say, but about less than two, minutes. Okay, yeah, less than two hours. <laughs> so uh, not not a whole lot of effort. Pretty easy to deploy. When it submits, we have a, a, a basic approval process. It's just going to one approver, the administrator, and it's not updating any PeopleSoft components on the back end, any delivered components. But we're keeping a signature log so we, we can see who did what. So that is what we're talking about for a, for a level one, uh, for a, a really basic form. Now, the reason it's important to identify this is because the difference between a simple form and a complex suite of electronic forms maybe several orders of magnitude. Um, that veteran status form, like we said, we built it in, in less than an hour. And uh, if we know that it was right, we could, we could migrate it and, uh, and stick it in production and, and be done. Uh, but that's not gonna be the case for more complex forms, especially ones where you're not certain yet what the requirements are. So let's look at level two, kind of the difference between level one and level two, and then we'll talk about the process of estimating and the strategy that we take when we're estimating an electronic forms process. So here a level two form might have a little, it's gonna have a little bit of tech involved. The first level for us in GTE forms had zero tech. That was all business analysts that, that uh, built that form in configuration only. Level two includes some search views. So you can consider if you have to do row level security, you're going to have to determine, well, who am I doing this form for? Or, uh, or what data is this form acting on? And I need to select that up front. And different form participants can see different rows. That's adding a significant amount of complexity. because There's some thought that has to go in there. There's some so uh, it's a technical task to build that search view and, uh, and it's going to take more time to test. We have fields on a page that uh, can include simple pre-population, maybe some defaulting behavior that's, uh, that's built in there. Level two, we might have grids on the page, repeating, sets of repeating data. Uh, valid value lists, and at this point when you're adding grids, uh, some tools become ineligible to accomplish this, like Forms and Approval Builder does not support grids. Uh, valid value lists can include 
lookups of system data that uh, that may be filtered. So maybe we're, we may be building custom views or we may be implementing cascading lookups. We have uh, uh, conditional hiding and showing of segments and fields on the page. We can have uh, approval routing that includes some logic in there to determine who gets the routing and who doesn't. And, uh, and when they receive those routings, either, uh, either notifications or, um, or approval requests. And at this level, we could have a, a, a simple CI updates to the PeopleSoft data. So again, this, you can see that there are some differences in complexity. At this, at this stage, we might be talking about uh, a couple of weeks of work, a week or so. Uh, to to accomplish this, to uh, to get through the development. So let's talk about the difference then about a process to go through and decide. Well, what are we, what are we looking at when we're uh, looking at automating this particular form? So the first step is to identify the scope. We're going to uh, in, in doing that, you want to uh, assign. We go through and we assign development and testing time for each major path through the business process. So a path for us, and, it, and this is where it helps not to think so much in terms of what you're coding or of what you're configuring and think more about how the business process actually works. So a path through the business process would include uh, a, a business pro a part of the business process that shares the same user population, page behavior, approval path, and the same system update. So, for example, if I had a uh, um, if I had a hire form and it needed to be able to handle both new hires and rehires, it's likely that those are two separate paths. the The new hire is going to have a different user population where the page behavior is gonna be different because the new hire isn't gonna be able to pre-populate and the rehire will. Uh, approval path might be different. There may be different approvers for a new hire than for a rehire. And we're gonna make different changes in, in the system for a new hire than for a rehire, even if it's the same form, even if it's the same pages that we're showing, because it's a different path, you should assign a chunk of development and testing time for that path. So identifying how many paths you're talking about will help you make sure that you don't underestimate the effort required to complete this automation project. You don't want to say, oh, well, these, it's all going to use the same, the same page, so it won't cost anymore. It will cost more because you have to think through it, you have to design it, you have to test it differently, and you have to get approvals from different uh, different business process owners. Then B, is, so you've got your number of paths, then you want to start from a list of possible scope components, break down to the individual pieces of scope functionality that are going to be added in there, and that includes edits, lookups, uh, it includes conditional behaviors, it includes integrations, it includes updates to PeopleSoft on the back end, and add development and test time based on those counts and complexity. So you're figuring out uh, how much time does it take to develop each path, and then how much do we need to add for all the different pieces of scope. You're going to want to identify your team. This actually should be number three here, I think. Oh no, this is still a two. So uh, we're going to, go through and consider who needs to be involved in this uh, and break that down to hours per week, their availability and the associated cost of the project. You're going to probably need a project manager. Solution architect is somebody who is the person who makes the decision, who helps to create the vision of the solution. And uh, then business owners are the people who own the different pieces of the of the uh, the different paths that we're looking to automate. Subject matter experts know how the current process works. Business analysts 
are capable of using the tools available to the configuration aspects of the tool and uh, creating and then working from design docs. Technical developers are going to be uh, PeopleSoft developers for doing this in PeopleSoft. You're going to have potentially end user trainers involved and then supporting resources like PeopleSoft administration, security, BDA. Identify all of them and, and the, uh, the time that they're going to be available. Um, if you're partnering with a consulting company like us, we may be providing some of these or all of these. Uh, well, we're not going to be providing the business owner. Uh, but uh, so you work with your consulting partner to determine the staffing model for the joint project. If you're doing it internally, you still need all those roles. So uh, there may be outside resources that, again, that's your consulting partners that may be added in to staff that project. Okay, so now we have the team, we have the scope, including the paths and the, uh, and the scope items that are part of it. And that, and we started off again talking about initial development and uh, and unit test. We tend to think in that respect. If you if you ask a developer for an estimate and say how long would it take you to build this, a developer and I am one. My typical response is going to be for my time and the time that it takes me to initially develop it and unit test it. That's not how long it takes to do a project. And as the developer, I'm not the only person who needs to be involved. So if, I, if you come and you ask me, how long would it take to build this? And I say, it's going to take two weeks. You say, okay, 80 hours times this person's cost. And that's how much this costs. Well, not necessarily. Who else needs to be involved? What's their cost? And what other... Uh, stages of the project do we need to go through before we can actually get to uh, production? So for example, if you start with that T, if it led, so I came back and I said two weeks, and uh, so we say 40 hours, and then maybe we, we go through the team on the previous tab and say, all right, well, if the tech says it's 40 hours of him, then it's also 40 hours of a business analyst, and maybe 10 hours each, of, uh, of these other roles and maybe um, five hours here and, uh, and another, another eight hours here. So you add all that up, now we're, we're talking about 140 hours instead of, instead of 40. And so far, we're only talking about development and unit test. Now you want to add, let's round it back to 100. Just as a basic rule of thumb, you can add 25% of that, another 25 hours, for to settle the design, to go back and forth with the business owners and the subject matter experts to determine exactly what it is we're gonna build. From our very extensive experience, the rework you'll do on average will add up to 40% of the development time. So you're gonna add 40 hours to that 100 hours. Uh, to uh, to rework the changes that you'll make to the design after you initially uh, build it. You'll come back, you'll look and say, oh, that isn't really what we want. You will. It's, uh, it always happens. So, um, so plan for it <laughs> or else it, it, one, of the, one of the main goals of estimation is you want to be right the first time. You don't want to have to go back for additional work for, for additional money for the same amount of work. Going back for additional money for new work that you've discovered that you could do along the way, we shouldn't feel terribly bad about that. If we say, hey, I, we discovered this new opportunity during development, we can, we can build this extra thing and, and save the organization a ton of money, it's just gonna take this much more funds. Uh, that, we shouldn't feel bad about asking for that, that's a new opportunity. But if we come back and say, well, you know, we thought it was gonna take $50,000, it's really gonna take 80. That's no fun, we wanna avoid that. So let's, let, if it's gonna take 80, let's figure that out up front. So 40% for the rework, 10% for each migration. 
So if you're going from dev to test and then test to production, add another 20 hours to cover that. If you're going dev to test, test to QA, QA to production, then add 30 hours. If you know that you're going to uh, actually refresh the dev instance in the middle of this project, so you have to migrate off and then back on, add 20 hours, one to migrate off and one to migrate back on. Uh, this migration is an often underestimated aspect of scoping a project. 10% for system hardening, that's uh, the project team uh, pounding through end to end in a test environment. And 15%, for UAT, that's where we go to the actual to the actual users and have them accept the product. Okay, so adding all of that up, you've got uh, uh, close to let's see that's uh, seventy nine. That's a, another basically you're doubling your hundred hours up to two hundred hours to get it all the way through to production. Okay, so. Again, that's the approach. Now let's uh, take that back and see how that might ramp up on a uh, on a larger uh, on a larger form process. This is a uh, this is a level two process, and this is a uh, security request form. The reason this is a level two is because it is doing uh, it's doing a CI update at the end of this process. That uh, is one of, uh, one of the criteria, at least. So we've got some, some powerful lookups here. This is, uh, uh, this is allowing us to create a user ID. We've got lots of lookups against existing information. We've got a grid. That's another uh, indication that this needs to be a level two. Repeating information always takes a little more effort. We've got lookups on all of these, so we can choose the roles that are gonna be created with this user ID. We're submitting it, we go through an approval process with a couple of different steps involved. And then after the approval process, we log in well, after the approval process, it will then update PeopleSoft and create that user ID. So that creation of the user ID means that you know, we're, we're doing more automation. Uh, we're not just interacting with the end user and asking for, uh, for information. We are also uh, automating the work that's being done on the back end. So that, again, level two. So a couple of thoughts again, before we look at level three and four, uh, as you're considering a couple of design considerations. One, we, we built this, uh, this little graphic to illustrate some options that one of our clients had. Uh, they, were, they were looking to reduce the amount of effort uh, for a rather large automation project by making their six different campuses uh, by making them standardize on one EPATH approach, personnel action form, one PATH approach. So they figured we're going to make it, we're going to reduce the overall effort because we don't want to build six different uh, paths. We don't want to build six different electronic forms. We only want to build one. Um, what we tried to illustrate here is that building one standard path for six different constituencies meant that there was a large amount of effort that would have to be done to get everyone to agree on what that one standard was. And so we said, yes, if we, if we already knew exactly what the, what the uh, design was and we already had the consensus, then yes, this is the amount of effort that it'll take to build that compared to building six different ones. But the point we were trying to make is if we have, if we instead try to build one flexible path that actually has considerations that, that allow for variation between the six constituencies, so maybe they can all have their own page that has their own custom fields on it. And they can have some situations where they have some of their own behavior, their own routing. 
our point was in overall effort, system effort, that's still gonna be more than if we had a standard path, but university or organizational effort, it's a lot less to have that flexibility in there than to have to come to consensus. Now, this particular client actually chose to go the one standard path anyway. This effort killed them. And what we hoped could be in terms of this effort, this was maybe three months of effort, but this work did not get done before we started. And so the overall project took two years. And it was almost all trying to get consensus among all of those different players. Whereas if we had allowed flexibility for the business owners and accommodated some of their uh, individual requirements, it would have been a lot easier for the overall project. It would have been done sooner. So I'll again, question. yes. Um, based on, I think that the last demo that you showed of the security access request form, um, one of our audience members asks, can an e-form be set up to copy security from an existing user to a new user? Uh, yeah, that would be a great requirement. As you saw here in the, uh, in the video, we pre-populated some information. Well, actually, we didn't, let's see, we didn't pre-populate, we just did lookups. But we could select, uh, have a search on the front end of this, select an existing user ID, and then use that information to pre-populate the other information, including the, the role list and the and these values. So yeah, that now that adds a little bit of complexity to this. It's still, I would still call it a level two because remember we said that search was part of it, but uh, search and pre-population, yeah, it'd still be a level two form. It would just be a little more complex than this one. Thanks, Paul. And if anybody Great else question. has any questions, feel free to pose those. Okay, so again, strategic st strategy here. We, uh, we want to minimize uh, or find a happy medium between effort and standardization as you, as you make your decisions. Uh, another thing to consider as you're designing your scope is what percent of the transactions you're going to cover. A lot of times we assume as we, and we don't even say it, it's we assume that we're gonna cover 100% of the transactions. If we're automating it, well, gosh, let's automate all of it. Well, here's how that really looks. You'll see that my, my uh, gradations here, th the middle of it is 90%. Okay, so uh, when we come up with this estimate using our process that we've talked about so far, we're talking about the one times, and it's probably gonna handle about 90% of your business process transactions. Now, if you want to cover 98%, it's probably going to take twice as much time and effort to get that other 8%. If you want to get to 99.5%, that additional 1.5% is going to cost you uh, another two times. You're going to multiply it by two again. And it's now four times what it took to get 90% of the coverage. And of course, these percentages are going to vary per business process. But the illustration is that you don't want to try to automate 100% of your transactions. It is better to automate 90, 95% and, uh, and not complicate the solution with all of these. You know, for example, okay, well, yes, we're, we want to do an additional pay form, but sometimes we do additional pay in order to do and to cover retro pay processing. And so if I build in a, a, a retro pay calculator to look back and figure out based on how old it is, how much additional work I need to pay them. Now we're talking about a whole different thing than just paying additional pay. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to do, but you may, it may be four times more expensive than just automating the collection of additional pay, of an additional pay request. So don't be locked into the idea that you have to automate 100% of the transactions. It's okay to take all of the big workload off of your end users and uh, by automating the easy stuff and then let the, let the people do the hard stuff. 
who, uh, and, and then you can always come back on phase two and, and do some more hard stuff. But there have been many uh, automation projects that have gotten into the weeds because we were fixated on covering every transaction and not willing to leave some of the complex transactions out of scope. Another consideration, are you gonna do it in config or are you going to do it in code? So basically you can do, build anything in code, uh, but if you build anything in code, just starting means that it's gonna be up the, up the effort line here quite a ways because once you've decided I'm building this in code, there's a, a base cost to write it, to test it, to migrate it, to bundle it, to back it up, uh, all that stuff. It, it's got a, a baseline. The easiest stuff, if you're gonna code it, it still has a, a, a level of complexity there. Uh, config can be really easy to start. It doesn't take any coding, you just go in, you make a configuration change, and GTE forms allows you to build forms with config, like Scott said, the level one form that we built was 100% config and got done in 45 minutes. So it's easy to start. But configuration options always have limits. There's always only so much you can do in configuration. There are always going to be able to be requirements that extend beyond the configuration capacity of a tool. So then, when you have an option to build something in code or in config, it's an easy decision when the config is easier than the coding. Uh, build it in config. It's, it's gonna cost less and it's gonna take less time. It's also an easy decision if you, it's actually no decision at all, if you're talking about building something that the config tool won't do, you're gonna have to code it. So at that point, yep, that part at least you're going to have to do in code. A harder decision is when you can do it either with code or with config, but it's going to be more effort to do it in config than with code. So which do you do? That is a harder decision because doing it in config gives you some additional benefits. You get some role plasticity. That means you, you can have a business analyst do it instead of a developer it's easier for the owners of the business process to see what's happening because they have access to the configuration but not to the code. You have more flexibility. It's easier to change than a coding change. It is easier, and I always forget what I meant when I said mobility, and I spent five minutes trying to remember what I meant before we started. If I remember it, I will tell you. <laughs> but. Uh, it doesn't mean deployability. Deployability means that it's uh, um, that it's more that it's easier to move it from instance to instance uh, and to uh, to get it. Oh no! Wait, I remember. I talked through it. Okay, so mobility is referring to the uh, ease of uh, of migrating it between instances. Deployability is referring to the fact that. Um, that a configuration-based option can give you, like GTE forms, gives you more opportunities to change how it's deployed. So for example, our ability to deploy as classic or as config, you can flip it from classic to config with one change of config, or, I'm sorry, from classic to fluid with one, ch one flip of a switch. Whereas if we uh, built it just using a, a coded solution, uh, you'd have to recode it in order to make it fluid if you started with classic. So there are benefits to, to config-based tools even at the point where they're complex enough that it's harder to do it in config. Okay, so back to level three. At this point, we're, we're talking about, uh, about some complex role-level search security views. Um, we've still got our fields on the page that are pre-populating and dynamically defaulting. Pre-populated grids, that's an, an additional add. So if we're saying we need to pre-populate a grid and add and have lookups and defaulting behavior on that grid, that's additional, uh, that's additional work than the, than the level two. 
if we've got code-based edits and updates on the field, so we have situations where you've got to write code in order to get an edit done, that makes it a level three. Complex conditional form behavior with cascading lookups. That's where one field, you select one field and it changes the valid value list for the next field down and, and on down every field. Very uh, powerful behavior, but also takes more effort and uh, more coding of usually custom lookup views in order to accomplish it. Hiding and showing segments and fields based on complex logic. So once you're having to write code, in order to make these determinations rather than just uh, using our, for example, our built-in logic engine with GTE forms. Now that's going to take more effort. Approval routings that are based on SQL or people code based logic. Again, level three now has got a lot more tech involved. We've got tech here at this level. We've got uh, tech here, tech here. We've got uh, probably tech here tech here, tech here, and more tech here. So it's becoming more technical. There's more code involved. Uh, but we're able to build a very robust uh, solution. For example, this chart field maintenance form. So here we, uh, we have lots of dynamic behavior. We, we saw this whole thing unhid when we chose create new crosswalk. Each one of these uh, different choices is opening up the opening up different options. We have very complex behavior. A new fund code opens up a, a request for new fund segment that needs to be filled out. Um, as we uh, we've got edits that are involved under a lot of these fields that tell us uh, what valid values are appropriate. Um, we're, we've got cascading lookups that uh, where the operating unit narrows down how many what departments we can choose. The department narrows down the funds, and uh, so we've got a lot of work done up front to keep the end user from being able to make mistakes. And as we make changes to that PC business unit field, we're changing the available valid values for project, and uh, and so on and so forth. So. A lot of power. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily harder to use. It means that there's been more work at design time uh, and build time in order to help the end user have this experience that's unfolding naturally to them as they're filling out the form. Again, they've got another uh, got another edit under there for the the format of the fund code. Lots of uh, lots of tech added in under the scenes. Now, GTE Forms has a, a very seamless way to integrate tech into the form development process so that we can get a smooth slide from simple to complex, uh, depending on what the requirements are. Here we've got, again, repeating rows. So this is, uh, and it's pre-populated. So we've got a list of questions that are already pre-populated. That's uh, another level three sort of, uh, of thing. We've got conditional changes in what pages we see here by changing one field, we go to a whole different page than we were going to previous, previously and with lots of additional grids. So every time that we're changing this fund type, we're, we're changing what, uh, what additional information we need, to, we need to gather. We've got the ability to support uh, um, attachments, uh, attachment support, doesn't really add a lot of complexity, but we can add, have required attachments. We can have conditionally required attachments. All of that can add some more complexity to the, to the process. Again, we've got edits that are built in. All that adds some complexity. We may have uh, conditional approval routes, multiple CIs updating multiple tables uh, for different chart fields. So, uh, so again, quite a bit of potential complexity. So let's go all the way to a, a level four, the, the really complex electronic forms process. Might have the, the scope might include multiple row level security based search views. So I want the, uh, 
I want the self-service users to have one experience and I want the department uh, administrators to have to see different views and I want their the approvers to be able to see different views based on role of security and I want different core office users to see different segments of the organization all of that can add a lot of complexity to the form um, complex pre-population and defaulting from coded sources so maybe I'm actually using an integration with an external system with another PeopleSoft instance or with a uh, or, or with a web service based uh, information repository to pre-populate the form uh, we've built forms where we pre-populate uh, an electronic form in PeopleSoft based on the based on the uh, data in a ticket in a ticket tracking system like ServiceNow that's a complex thing to do we've got an integration built into the actual population of the form uh, grids with complex data manipulation so uh, we're, we're figuring out um, for example overtime rules on a uh, time on a timesheet form where um, the uh, the pay rate changes on on certain rows when you add more rows at the bottom because all of a sudden now we're, we're applying overtime rules um, integration based edits and updates if I have to go to uh, to the financial system from the HR system to see if there's available budget and and uh, put an edit in based on the results that's complex we need to make sure that our scoping uh, accounts for that role level security other complex logic for interdependent lookups so if I want to look up that only shows me the departments that I have access to or the positions that I have that are in the departments that I have access to and then drive other fields off of that that can get again very complex even though from the form from the user perspective it may not look that much more complex it's all under the scenes hiding and showing segments based on complex logic uh, sorry I flipped my slide too soon conditional approval routing that uh, again we had that last time oftentimes you can build a uh, um, you can build a form automation that updates many components on the back end a higher form might update personal data and uh, and job data and position data and dependent data and benefits data and we can build all those just every time we add another automation another target component we're making the form a little more that more that much more complex and uh, and uh, you know, where we're popping, you know, what logic is happening in those CI updates? Are we actually pulling data from the form or are we doing complex logic in the code itself to determine what to put into PeopleSoft? So again, those are some requirements. So what we hope is you can take this uh, deck and look at your own forms and say, well, what fits? Uh, what, how do our requirements fit into this? And, and uh, are we appropriately scoping based on that so here's an example oh, got a question of, yes go right ahead uh, i know that there's a lot that you want to do in this last demo but let me jump in on this uh, so when working with the more complex forms how does the framework ensure that field selections are cleared when the user changes their mind on initial selections that pre-populate data is it something that has to be taken care of in each data element to clear out when values change on the form, or is there an easier way to have a clean slate to avoid possibility of bad data? Uh, great question. So there are a number of tools that we use. First off, um, in GTE forms, each field, the, the, um, you, you could derive the logic by saying, okay, I'm gonna have a, a top-down piece of, of code that pushes initial data into all the fields. And then if you do that, then every time that can change, you need to have more code to, uh, to change that, to blank out those initial values and make a change. GTE forms actually allows you to assign the defaulting to the field that's being defaulted. So I can say, well, this field gets its initial value from this uh, from this record, from this data, data pool record. And, uh, and then if that data pool record changes because of a change on a different field, 
that field, th that uh, the field in question will automatically update. So yes, we've got a lot of tools that make that easier to happen. So actually by hooking all of that up, it just automatically will blank out when the, uh, when the, the user changes one of the default values. Um, there are some situations where, in, again, in complex coding situations where you may have to build code in to go through and, and blank out fields and such forth. But we can actually handle a lot of that robust behavior just based on how we initialize the field and what we say should update that field value. Okay, great question. All right, so uh, I'm just gonna run through uh, one more demo here at the end. This is a benefit enrollment form. A, uh, that's a, a very complex business logic piece. You can see lots of pre-populated information and then opportunities to answer questions. Asking questions is a great way to, uh, to interact with the user. If you can drill things down to yes or no's instead of yeses and no's instead of lookups, that makes a big difference. So you can see each of these is, is conditionally changing the form downstream from it. Asking for additional information based on their answers. Uh, dependence and beneficiaries. Again, if the answer is yes, we have more questions to ask and more uh, information to answer and, and some edits, some lookups that, uh, and you can see there, we defined the edge of the scope there. We said, okay, if you're, if you have a non-US dependents, then we're gonna take this offline. Uh, it's wise to be able to make the edges happen there. Got lots of uh, lots of data fields here. Ability to add uh, again. We've got edits going on, and uh, the ability to add additional additional information. This is all still configuration based. There was no development involved in putting the fields on the pages, but there is a lot of code that's been added underneath and a lot of work to come up with the, uh, the valid values and to make those valid values responsive to, to uh, and cascading. But we're accomplishing a really powerful business process uh, use case here. And uh, a benefits enrollment, and we're, we're looking at a benefits enrollment form that is a configuration-based form. We didn't actually have to write any uh, fluid code in order to build this fluid-based benefits enrollment form with lots of power underneath there. But again, we don't want to underestimate the fact that it's config does not mean that it's free, it does not mean that it's, that it's uh, easy, it does not mean that there isn't a lot of work involved to get all the rules put together that you're seeing happen here. All of this, conditional behavior that's based on previous entries in the form. It takes a lot of work to do that, a lot of thought, and a lot of agreement between your, uh, between your various business, uh, business owners and subject matter experts in order to get this kind of a, a very robust behavior. But this form is actually going to go through all of the uh, enrollment options for a for a major uh, for a major benefit to provider, so I've got as you've seen lots of edits, lots of pages involved, summary page that shows everything that has been decided, uh, the ability to upload additional documentation to. Uh, to support the, uh, the business process and action items to kind of gather initials at the end of the form. And then off we go to actually perform after approvals to uh, actually update the system with all of that information. And here we are back in PeopleSoft 
with that information having been automatically entered. It was initiated by an employee and entered into PeopleSoft with no uh, manual effort required. That is a powerful form. And it's a full burger that uh, definitely satisfies. Again, we've done all this with GTE forms and, uh, and that allows us to build extremely complex forms that, uh, or that can be simple for the end user to use and easier to maintain than if we were coding these just by, by from scratch in PeopleSoft. And well, we again, can be mobile, can be mobile without doing mobile development. Okay, let's go to questions. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, so I see you can require attachments. Can you provide materials like the classic people tools forms or approval did? Fluid people tools forms does not have this feature any longer. For example, provide policy documents related to a form action. So basically the question is, can you provide documents and make documents available for download? Uh, and the answer is yes. You can, uh, we can pre-populate, for example, the attachments and, uh, and automatically attach a field or a, a document to a form. That's a, a technical process to do that. You can very easily add links though to, uh, to a form to, for example, to um, any of the, the form pages, either in the segment description or segment instructions or the uh, uh, instructions at the top of the page. You can add links that are download links to allow people to, uh, to download documents um, so yeah, you've got lots of flexibility as to how to get a document to somebody. Uh, putting a link in isn't a technical, uh, isn't a technical issue. If you can make the document available for download uh, at a place where you can get the URL, then sticking a URL into the rich text of a, uh, of a segment instruction or form instruction, page instruction is easy to do. And then we've got another question here. If anybody else has any to post, uh, feel free to do so. We have another minute and a half or so. Um, does the complex form ever tell where you are in the form? Uh, for example, 80% complete or a step three of six, et cetera. Uh, great question. We do um, have a, 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 a completion bar on our classic forms. We haven't actually brought that forward onto the fluid yet, but uh, that's something that we, that we uh, could definitely do and we'll consider that as as a uh, um, consider that as a enhancement request just because you said it that's some power there you go any other questions uh, not right now okay well I'm just going to click through a, a couple of other slides here again these are just some of the things that you get out of GTE forms that are uh, powerful, that allow you to do things in configuration that would otherwise require code, including auto population and defaulting. Just being able to pre-populate a form without having to do code, that's a, a, an amazingly powerful feature uh, that became available in, in version three of our, of our framework. Um, related displays, restricted prompt values, all of that can be accomplished without additional coding. So lots of, uh, lots of powerful features um, and lots of, uh, lots of success. We've been able to, uh, the benefits enrollment form that we just looked at was from the University of South Carolina, who by putting forms, electronic forms on the front ends of their business process, as they implemented PeopleSoft, actually got to a point where 86% of all human interaction with their PeopleSoft applications is through an e-form. They have completely customized the experience and simplified the experience of their users in PeopleSoft by putting forms at the beginning and in front of it. And at the same time, they've made their implementation extremely vanilla because they've kept modifications out of all of those backend pages they would have otherwise had to modify.
Paul, we just had two more questions come in, and I think then we have to wrap it up probably. Lovely. Um, is the attachment functionality using PeopleSoft delivered attachment, or is it a standalone feature? To use attachment functionality on GTE form, do we have to open up attachment feature on entire application? Uh, the answer to the second part is no. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to open it up elsewhere. The uh, answer to the first part of the question is we use some of the delivered PeopleSoft libraries as we're doing the attachment management, but we, it, it's our own storage approach. And uh, so, yeah, you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to enable anything system-wide in order to be able to use attachments in our forms. You get to choose in, in setup whether those forms are stored in the database, whether the attachments are stored in the database or stored on a, uh, a file server. And we also have some clients who we build integrations so that we store those attachments actually in external enterprise document management systems. And I love this last question. Are there plans to give approvers a sort of single page view to allow validation and approval of multiple forms at a time? Why, yes. <laughs> we, uh, we already have a tool called GT Action Center. And if you're an enterprise subscriber to GTE Forms, you already have access to it. Uh, GT Action Center allows you to, it gives you a, uh, kind of like a, a work list on steroids view where you can see form information from all the forms that are in your approval work list. And the idea is, and then you can do bulk approval actions. So the idea is to show the approvers uh, just the information that they need in order to make a decision, kind of highlight the stuff that they need to pay the most attention to, and, uh, and it allows them to, to uh, be able to approve forms, lots of forms for their work list without having to open those forms, just by looking at the summary data that we provide in the Action Center, and then, but still have the ability to drill into individual forms as necessary. So yes, bulk approval tool, GT Action Center is what you want to ask Scott about. Uh, and we can, again, it's included. And it's, it is a tool that to be most effective needs some customization work that uh, to display the right information that you need for each of your given form types. But we're happy to talk that through with you and give you a demo. Thanks, Paul. And, uh, Perry, uh, the, another point on that question is if you go out to our blog, and I'll send you a link to this, there is a, a write-up on a couple of really cool add-on tools to GTE Forms. One of those is the Action Center. The other one is GT Analytics. So I'll send you a link after the, after the webinar. I think that's it. Unless anybody else has any last-minute questions to pose. Paul, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Uh, oh, hang just, on a sec. Uh, hang on. There's one okay. other question. Oh, <laughs> never mind. It's just Perry saying thank you. Oh, very good. You're welcome. Uh, one thing I'll mention is we, again, I, hopefully these, uh, the slides earlier in the deck here that you'll have access to, to download, hopefully the step-by-step uh, the -step process will be, will be helpful to you. Um, that's the uh, uh, scoping automation step-by-step. We also have a tool for our licensed clients that, uh, that we can help to, uh, to fill out for you that we call the TARDIS that follows this approach to scope um, and, and to scope eForms projects specifically. We're happy to help you scope any of your outstanding projects, even if you're not engaging us to help you do it. Um, we're, we're happy to help with that. So. Uh, so again, and we'll, we'll use that tool to, to help. So feel free to give us a call if we can help in any of those scoping activities for your eForms efforts. Thanks, Paul. And thank you to everyone for joining the webinar this afternoon. You will be getting an email here within the next couple of days with links uh, to view the webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can reach me at scott at gideontaylor.com. You can also find us on the web. Uh, via our website and our YouTube channel. There's a lot of great demo videos out there. And join us for any of our future webinars.
Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.